concept of RGB. Raise your hand. A good amount. <clears throat> How many of you know CMYK? Good amount. How many of you know have a digital camera? Okay, that's excellent. How many of you have played with uh, Photoshop? Okay. Um, how many of you have used the Python pillow library? Okay. Um, now, we're going to get get into some, something interesting. How many of you have tried to do a photo print? Okay. Yep. How many of you have tried to shift the color space of an uh, image? Two, three. Excellent. How many of you have run uh, monetary calib uh, mon monitor calibration? Really? Why do you do that? <laughs> you only need like black and white. So, Stu, why did, did you run your monitor calibration? Any, any particular reason? No reason? OK. okay. Right, right. <clears throat> um, how, many, uh, how many of you have a uh, printer at home? OK. OK. How many of you have tried to print a photo of your, you know, of your own? OK, I um, see a consistent pattern here. Some, some people have gone a bit too far. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <clears throat> so I guess the, this talk, I, we have one minute. Um, I guess this talk is uh, less about one particular library which I'm sure like all of you can go back and just read the talk. Um, I want this talk to be a, a little bit about the, the concept of how to reason about these kind of stuff. Because um, when we started, I'll, I'll let you know like, wh why I'm getting into this uh, mess. Mm, but um, I found it very hard to think of this um, whenever there's a a problem when you think of it, there are multiple input points that change. Um, when they change, they actually affect each other. So, for example, um, how many of you have uh, drive a helicopter before? Hey, yeah. Um, <clears throat> how many of you have debug a system where you don't know the relationship between multiple inputs? Yeah. How many of you have? been bitten by a bug in a multi-threaded uh, application. <laughs> yeah. So that's the problem. Like, um, this whole image processing is a very sophisticated, complicated, arcane, mathematic tense topic. And uh, the classic textbook on this topic is 600 page thick, printed in black and white. You know, a book about color theory has nothing but mathematics and, and, and black and white ink. And so when I got into this field, I realized there's no such, no, nobody talk about this like, whole theory in a very easy to understand way. So today I'm going to give you the talk, which is from atom to pixel and back. So hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll have a good understanding of when you take a picture, okay, take a picture of anything, you see the picture showing up, the very sophisticated process that happened in between. It's a fascinating process. And hopefully that one day when you sit down uh, with someone else and they point um, uh, uh, at something on the monitor and say, that color doesn't look right, you know, you know roughly what to think about it. And, uh, and also, I would like to present this talk in a way that, you know, I spend significant amount of time writing uh, JavaScript code now. You know, I, I love Python, but the more and more of my time actually going to writing uh, JavaScript. So there is a um, lightning talk yesterday, talk about like, you know, the, the, some people say like the lifespan of Python has gone to the, to the peak, you know, there's a development actually stagnant. So I want to show you guys the possibility you can do with Python that um, sometimes actually extends further from the core language. Actually, you know, um, you can see examples of using Python to generate JavaScript code. 
at the very end. Okay, so let's go in. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I, in my previous life, I, I written a search engine. I um, have done uh, some interesting work. Um, about three years ago, my wife and I we decided, you know, we, we, we really want to slow down and have a baby or something. Um, so I was looking for, <coughs> excuse me, a industry that's a very old industry that can be improved dramatically by using software technology or robot, robotic. So the one I found was a, uh, a photo printing industry. Um, photo printing industry, the last revolution, you know, and it has been with us since like late uh, 1800. Um, the last revolution in this industry is about dot-com bubble where you can finally print your own photos from online. But the, the, the process of printing the photo and making the photo um, product has not been changed. Um, in the US alone, there are about 2,000 companies uh, do photo printing this year, which means that there's a lot of labor intensive, um, there's not much automation going on. So I saw the industry and I feel, okay, <clears throat> that's the industry I can do better by using software to automate a lot of the stuff and by using robotic technology to automate a lot of the labor, labor physical stuff. So that's how I get in. Um, so the, the, the topic today is, has very little Python in it. And I would like to call it a, a hate and love story with the Python or uh, the, the, the story of, um, of abandonment and redemption. <laughs> um, basically, the the, def, uh, the status quo of the image process in Python is like terribly broken. It's not even usable. Um, but let's get on to that. So we have four topics I want to cover. First, when we take a picture, how do we capture light? The second one is once we capture the light, how do we store them? You know stored them in a JPEG file, but what happened behind that? And then the last, uh, the se third one is how do we display color? You know, when, when you um, get a JPEG, you open up on your computer or you open up um, on, you know, project onto a screen. Like what happened behind there? The last one is really the, the redemption part is um, some really fun thing. And every people, uh, everybody I talk to is really surprised you can do that. So let's do the capturing light. A camera, a good camera. So when you take a picture, oh, this is the camera with the lens off. When you take a picture, the light will, how, how can we see light? The light come in because the sun generate these like, you know, spectrum of, of frequencies and it project onto the earth and then different object, we, you know, reflect the light, right? So the atom, if each, Atom, when, when hit by the light, it has a different frequency. And then, you know, as your uh, physics, um, if you remember that, it reflects different uh, frequency of the light. So that light going to the camera through the lens onto the sensor. So let's go into the sensor. The sensor is really nothing really fancy. It has a few uh, mechanical components. Um, this one, low pass, basically filter out some really, um, the lights our eyes cannot see, but uh, the sensor can see. So you want to filter those out. But what's really interesting is this sensor, CMOS sensor. So the light hit the sensor, what happened there? This is a sensor if you zoom in. Now, each manufacturer has very different um, way to, manu uh, to make these sensors. This is a CMOS sensor. So what's in the sensor is that you see an array of RGB uh, 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 sensors. So each of them allow one color. Uh, 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 it's, a, it's a, like how many of you know the uh, signal processing or the, 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 the frequency uh, filtering? Yeah. So basically if you shine a light on, onto a red stuff, only the red light comes out, right? Um, this one is done in a way that you actually break an incoming light into three different type of uh, um, 
uh, into RGB bands, basically. So when you lay millions and millions, so every centimeter has about a million of these. Just think about it. It's crazy. And then each one is a cube, is a very square, and then it, uh, every square has three uh, bands to it, so RGB, which is a, this one is not 100% accurate because it's actually, you know, it's like three, uh, three lines. And then what happened there is once the light getting here and then hit the, the bottom, it generates electricity, very tiny electricity. Um, I can't see this. So you actually generate electricity on here. So you can see, OK, this one has a little bit electricity. Um, so we can see it's a, you know, it has a little bit R in it, things like that. Um, that's the process pipeline. And then once you, you get the electricity, you have the sensor, you can measure them, you can convert them into digital signals, and then you give them a value. And that's how you get RGB value. So when I ask you guys, um, when we started, I said, like, you know, how many of you know RGB and how many of you know CMYK? Right? So, CMYK is a, the technology when, when, when we print stuff. So the T-shirt the or things on here, all printed with the CMYK. But the, the photos we've taken are in RGB. So now here, there's a story I need to tell you guys. So Otago Uni, a friend of mine, worked for Otago Uni, uh, the library. And they just spent about 160 grand scan a lot of the uh, archival photos into digital, digital image. And they came to me and say, some of the color looks really weird. Was, uh, OK, let's sit down and, and have a look. So it turns out that they was using a not very accurate library called Pillow. Let me show you guys what, what I mean by that. So it's very simple. Uh, we have a image. Um, let me open it up. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Very simple. We have a color mode here, CMYK. So when the designer designed, uh, this is an example. It's not one of the copyrighted content. Uh, it's a CMYK. So they said, okay, let, let's convert it into RGB. Um, I won't get into the details of the pillow, but... Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's the standard pillow library. You, 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 you open it up, very simple. And then they even provide a very helpful library called uh, Convert. Yeah, you can convert it into any mode you like. Okay, we, we do Convert and then we, we save it. You know, simple as that, what can possibly go wrong, right? Um, and let's name it RGB. Did you see that? <laughs> it's not 100% accurate, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> um, and I have like even better, better examples. Um, Sometimes the background uh, turned completely black and white. Um, just, just not right. So, you know, this talk is not about like you know bashing pillow. I think it hasn't been upgraded for quite a while. Um, it's more about like help you to think. Okay, when something's not right, like where the potential problem is. So here is clearly the the color mode is not correct. So whenever you are dealing with a a, sorry, where's my presentation? Whenever you're dealing with a image not accurate problem, there's really only three parameters uh, you'll be looking at, and this is one of them, like mode. Okay, what is the mode? <clears throat> Let's get to the second one. Uh, 
Oh, another very important thing is when you convert from CMYK to RGB or convert anything between one mode to another, you, you, you're going to lose data. So that's another very important concept, which I, I'll show you later uh, in another topic, but uh, just keep that in mind. OK, so now that we have um, all these like you know digital data representing an image, how do we store them? So let me introduce you the concept of color space. So color space is, when you think of the you know, color space, RGB, each color, if you use um, 8K to represent it, right? So on theoret you know, theoretically, you have a color space of 256 power of 3. But in fact, not all the color are uh, human eyes visible, right? It's, our eyes can only get to certain like you know spectrum. So when you plot out the the massive um, color space our human eyes can see on a two-dimensional space, it looks like this, like a uh, you know like this this weird shape. Um, and you can see all the all the color. Uh, you know, our human eyes can see. Now, this uh, called Pro Photo RGB is the maximum theoretical limit of how much the current CMOS technology can capture. Okay, so it means that as long as you are um, taking a photo using a CMOS sensor, there are some color that are gonna be lost the moment you, you take the uh, photo. So if, if um, there's an artist came to you and said, hey, I, I think you, you, you know computer well. Can you help me to scan these photos into the computer? Now, there's some smart person might say, oh, easy. I'll just set it up. I can take a photo of your painting. And that's, that way, you don't need to buy a really expensive scanner. Um, uh, that most of the time that works, but if you have colors very rich in this area and this area, you know those information will be lost. So now remember, this Pro Photo RGB is only for CMOS-based uh, sensor technology. Now, if you use a a scanner, it'll have quite different color space. If you use a different um, pro uh, not projector. Um, chemistry, for example, you develop your photo, color photo using chemistry. It has a different, um, you know, uh, area as well. So CMYK, um, the color that can represent it when you print using the CMYK technology is much, much narrower. So that's the, the shape you're getting. Very narrow. That's why, like, sometimes when you s scan a, um, a very old photo using CMYK technology instead of a painting, it's actually very safe to take a photo of it because, you know, you, your space is well covered. sRGB, our friend. So one of the fundamental assumptions of Pillow, which is no longer accurate, is everything is done in sRGB. So Pillow assume all the images it's handling is in sRGB, which is not 100% accurate. Um, as you can see that sRGB uh, has still slightly s smaller. Um, there's some overlap with CMYK, but not a lot. So all the uh, monitors or image processing software by default will use sRGB. So be very conscious about it when you open up a file and do anything about it. Because unless um, you deliberately set the color space to a much wider uh, color space, it'll default to sRGB. And then you will lose tons of color. You know? So these colors are wedding photographers, a lot of the, the color around here. Um, if you are doing like landscape photography with sun, sunrise or sunset, a lot of the color here are gone. So it you know, depends on the subject. Um, 
So when you get a JPEG file and you want to store them, uh, store all the information we get from, a sen uh, from the sensor, each JPEG file actually has uh, three parts to it. That's the defined in the JPEG uh, specification. Metadata, very simple, longitude, latitude, DPI, that kind of stuff. Not interesting. Color space definition, that is the key. So it's not unusual for many image files, like because I'm printing a lot of photos for, for my customers. A lot of the photos, especially Android phone, they're, they're bad. Like most of the photos you've taken with the Android phone, they don't even define a color space. <laughs> um, it's like, well, you know, guess it's a sRGB. <laughs> And that's very lethal. I'll show you why that's the case. Um, now, with the late, latest um, um, Apple hardware, now you are getting this uh, retina, and then the, the Apple camera now capture much wider, much, much wider uh, color space than sRGB, right? And I hope Android one day will, will support that as well. So. You need all three parts to work. Like missing any parts, you'll have to default to a, to a common denominator. OK, so give you an example of um, what happened when you try to squeeze the um, color, one color space, you know, <clears throat> the colors in one color space into another. So for example, you take a photo with your, you know, your proper camera. And you take it to a, um, ah, what, what the hell? I just mentioned the name, warehouse stationery, right? <laughs> they have this like super fancy printer, and then they print using Windows uh, Pinter or something. <laughs> it's like not even close. <laughs> it's like Windows Pinter. Side story. The best operating support, like operating system support of color is uh, OS X. Like, uh, as early as uh, 1995, they have a huge range of color space supported. That whole thing does not exist on Windows. Neil, I haven't even checked into uh, Linux. I don't <laughs> hope much. It's like, um, it's like it, you've got to put a lot of work into it to, to make the API for that. And uh, to use a Windows image viewer, it's just like, what can I say? OK, let me give you a couple of examples. We have two dots in this, um, um, this photo. Um, so Adobe RGB is the, what you call the industry standard for uh, photographers, which is a short for Adobe RGB 1998. So that's how advanced the whole system is. You know? Everybody is still using 1998 technology. <laughs> anyway, that proves our point. So when you squeeze that, to a um, to a you know sRGB monitor, you can see the top circle actually push down, yeah. So that lose color, you know. You can see the color actually on the top. You have a slightly darker green, greenish, and then the yellow is kind of balanced. And when you push down to the laptop, it's almost like already a little bit yellow to yellow. And then that inkjet printer was assuming a, uh, I don't know which printer that is, but you can see because from the laptop display to the inkjet printer, that color space actually, they have a huge overlap. There's no um, color lost. Um, the bottom there, because you know, it's it just a color shift, it's actually, you don't, you don't lose that much color. OK, so I want to show you same image, how different they can look uh, when you do nothing but change their color space. And to make the demo even more fun, um, I'll use um, some interesting, I mean, it's professional work. Um, I've got an agreement to use them. But you'll see, like, if this is your, your kid, you don't want them to, to look any. This is like done by a photographer, a professional photographer. She got the skin color, you know, a little bit. This 
the color gamut, the color space of that thing is very narrow. <laughs> so I turn the lights off so you guys can see more color, but it's very narrow. Um, I hope you can still see most of the, the skin color is, you know, white with a little touch of uh, pink. Not a lot. Um, here is slightly more pinkish than uh, in the, on the top. Now, let's open them up in Photoshop. <clears throat> mm. Mm. No way. What? Okay. <laughs> Photoshop is not working. The rest of the demo is gone. <laughs> okay. Okay, let me full screen that. You know, that's what you see is the intent, the the what the photographer have in mind. Now, in Photoshop, um, there's a color setting. Okay. <clears throat> so. Let's change a few things. Um, it's, it's a. Can you guys see the, the the change at all? Apple RGB. Very very white. Um, color match. Now <clears throat> this one. <clears throat> you never want your kid's photo to look like, like this. You know. So what happened is once you take a. Um, a narrow color space photo and try to explode it out into much wider space, it will push everything out. And that just like destroy the whole intent. Um, while we are here, I want to show you. So basically, there are really only two engines um, that I know of that does these kind of things, does a good, reasonable job. One is from Adobe ACE, which is a newer version, or Apple. So both of them actually did an excellent job. OK, um, let's go back to our talk. So let, let's, let's recap here. We talk about the color mode. So when you, when you um, take a photo, it depends on which kind of sensor technology you have. You know the the you know the 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 mode determining a large chunk of what you're doing. The second thing we just showed is the color space, i.e., when you store them, like the physical file you're storing the the imaging, also have a huge impact. Now, sometimes you because we don't have to worry about it. Sometimes you take the photo in sRGB, um, they store in sRGB, they display on the sRGB. So the whole thing is actually quite simple. But as soon as you diverge, you, um, you will run into problems. So let's see the third thing, which is once we have the image all stored in the file, when we display them, what are the complexities here? Ah. I forgot to show another thing that's <laughs> messed up with uh, Pillow. <laughs> so Pillow has this like really nice, in the new, feet, uh, new um, version, they have a very nice feature called ICC list. Basically, ICC list is an attempt to read into the file and then pull out the color space and, and all that kind of good jazz. So that's what I got when I <laughs> run the thing. Empty array. Oh, it's better than a now. <laughs> <laughs> OK, how do we display colors? Um, so I'll give you two examples of how we, how we show the color, how we, when we print the photo, how do you get the colors out. So this is one an LED. So um, when you look at a monitor, how that works is you have, remember when we, um, the sensor, how it works is you have RGB, 
right? And then the RGB lights coming, and then depends on the strength of the signal. You, you know, like, you know, the RGB. Here is a, almost a revert version of it. It basically shines a white light through a, a, a matrix of RGB bars. And then it has a polarizer. Basically, polarizer, polarized lens is that the, you can you know, decide where the color go and how, you know, the stronger they go, the stronger they go straight forward into your eyes. And by tweaking the polarizer, you kind of like, you can control the strength of the light, right? So for a um, display technology, um, that's pretty much like RGB in, RGB out. That's how it works, you know, the lighting, then you use the polarizer to divert the color and then reduce the strength. What's becoming more interesting is this one. So professional photo printing, um, so C CMYK has only four color. Um, your typical home-based uh, photo printer has about six color. If you walk into a, um, a Harvey Norman or warehouse, they may have a nine color printer, and then the printer we've got about 12 color. Okay. So what does that mean is that we have multiple color to represent one, one color in, 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 in so CM, CMYK, the C is cyan, you know, is a greenish color. So you can see here is that we have a photo cyan and a normal cyan. So what happens there is all these printer manufacturers has come up with very sophisticated algorithms to say, okay, for this point in the color space, you know, I will break that color down into an array of um, 12 colors, such that I can give it as much, uh, you know, ink as possible to, 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 the, to represent the color more faithfully. Now, this technology is completely different from how um, we see things in, in monitor. There's no RGB whatsoever there. You basically try to use four color to emulate the sRGB. As a result, you can see, you can, you can, you can realize that there's really no simple way to say, okay, I, I, I look at a, a file, I know roughly what the RGB numbers are. I can, like, you know, just get a print faithfully. That's not going to happen because there's a huge translation layer, you know. Depends on which kind of ink set you have. Now, if we take one step further, if you print onto different uh, paper, you have thick paper, you have um, matte paper, which is like more subdued, you have high gloss paper. That's a gazillions of paper. A, a color, same color printed onto different paper will look dramatically different, right? So that actually brings out the question, how can I making sure that the color I'm seeing is the color I'm getting in the, in the physical file. You know, if the ink are different, if the paper are different, how can I do that? So there's a third bit coming in, which is called a color profile, um, which I'm going to give you a demo. Um, so color profile basically describe, given any color space, here is how I drive the hardware to do that kind of job, okay? So let me show you. So I have four different um, paper stock here listed. Um, don't worry about the exact name. There are different product we're offering, the paper are different. So that is the same printer. Same printer, same image. Um, by swapping out the conversion definition between color space and what you end up getting, I can actually simulate what the final result might look like on the printout on the screen. So I'm going to show you this. You can see the color actually dim a little bit. Um, um, how can I do this one without? Maybe I move it over. 
Okay, so metal print is a metallic paper. It's very high sheen. So when you get it, it's faith, very faithful. Now, this one. This one is a uh, nine-color printer on fabric. So it's not a paper anymore. And because it's a fabric, it reflects less light. Um, it's less like shiny. So when you do this, you can see you know, the, the color are actually less saturated. It's more matte. Um, now, same material, different printer. So this one you're saying is nine color. And I'm going to show you what it might look like on a 12 color printer. You know, the more color you have, the more, you know, details you can coming out. Now, if you are a good um, photographer, Pay attention to the cheek when I switch them again. You know, s slight, but when you print them big, it's actually really uh, make a huge difference. Um, so, recap. We have a color mode that determines how the, the light's coming. We have a color space defining how the color coming and what kind of the device we're using. We also have a uh, translation layer definition that tells us, OK, how can you translate this color space into the, the target color space? Um, that's all fine, but you know, in Python, how can we get this one work? You know? So pillow is totally not working. Um, so at one point, what I did was I used a, um, so a bunch of guys in Silicon Valley, they wrote this uh, web service called ImageIX, a bunch of YouTube guys. So they basically bought about two or three thousands of Mac minis. And then they used Object C, which is a programming language, to code against the Quas 2D, which is a data translation mechanism that the operating system offers. And they make that capacity, capacity available via a web service. So for a while, I used that. But one day, I, I, read, I was like, you know, I, I can't remember what I was doing. But one day, I browsed in the net, and I found out that actually Photoshop has a TCP server built in. And even better, you can automate Photoshop using JavaScript. Okay, so that opens up a huge range of possibilities. And uh, <laughs> so theoretically, you can create a TCP socket to a Photoshop port and then let it run whatever you like. Um, so that's how I found this library. It's called um, PyPS. It's a very thin uh, wrapper around the Photoshop TCP port. Um, there's no documentation, no doc stream at all. Basically, go figure. <laughs> um, for those of you who want to have a play, I want to show you where the. So in Photoshop, preferences under plugins, you can say enable remote connections. Okay, if you toggle that on. You get you get access to the TCP socket, and now I'm gonna show you the same photo we we've we've done. Um, okay, this is the file we were looking at, and there is actually a a. Um, Photoshop command let you switch mode. Okay, if we switch mode, switch mode. It doesn't change your color at, at all, uh, which is quite amazing. So let's let's do a, a bit live demo to give us a bit hope. So we basically import that, and when we create a connection, and then we connect using the most secure password. Four digit, a six digit, 
And let me show you this line. So basically, it, it, this line is a uh, ES uh, three or four standard. So you can pretty much run uh, most of the JavaScript code this way by 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 to C send sync, which is given the current Photoshop application, get to the current active document, change mode, and a parameter. Very simple. So let me do that. OK. Was it successful? Yeah. Successful, and then let me see. No, it's not. Mm. OK. Oh, sorry. That was the wrong, uh, wrong command. It should be app, not document. OK, is this right? Yeah, RGB. So now, this, is, this has uh, brought us to a very interesting topic I want to talk about, which is Python. Um, because Photoshop does not support scripting via Python. So. I probably have to write JavaScript, but the way I ended up doing it can be useful is that I generate all my data, like you know, data-driven programming, I generate all the data um, in JSON format, which is language neutral, and I use Jinja template in Python to render, to generate those uh, JavaScript. And once I have a huge JavaScript ready to go, I'll send it through to that API. So this way, I can still use Python um, to still use the Python like unit tests and all that kind of like nice thing I can I can control um, without using any mock or and still get the result I want. So I think that's a fascinating thing. And another um, next year maybe I'll give a talk on robotic. And if you think of robotic, all the CNC machine and you control them by uh, issuing what they call G code. And G code is uh, invented by um, in the in the 60s. It has a, a few characters at the beginning, basically represent get your knife up, move to a point, put it down, do a line, and then the rest part of uh, are just parameters. It's pretty much assembly language. But because I'm having all my data structure in Python, I generate G code using Python. You know, just do whatever I want and translate that into um, into G code, and that's a common thing I'm seeing here. Is that as more and more um, features move to the front end that require a lot of JavaScript on the front end, and more and more stuff we do are uh, in hardware related, the Python has become this middle layer that managing data and manipulating data and change the shape and do all the processing, and then the um, that the output or the presentation they are controlled by other languages, and that's the 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 whole like architecture I end up with, which I'm very happy with. Um, especially when you're thinking of like how can you test a JavaScript stuff. I mean, I can test them now, but it's never pleasant. <laughs> and not to mention all these like you know nested stuff. But Python you just read them through, and the test framework is just gorgeous. Um, so that's about it. Um, I don't have any slide except for say thank you. <laughs> questions? Uh, yeah, so thank you very much, Alex. I don't know that we have time for questions. No, don't worry. Okay. So um, okay. I'll, I'm sure you'll, you'll be happy to answer questions in person yeah, yeah, yeah. around Definitely. the place. Definitely. Um, so there are a couple of notices. Uh, up next is the hacking session, which will not actually be any sort of structured thing.